Happy New Year. I didn't have a microphone on and I was about to have that embarrassing moment. I do want to tell you that it is not too late not only to give toward credit in 2023, but it's not too late to buy the pastoral staff Christmas presents. We welcome them. Uh, we accept them, in fact, through the first six months of 2024. And you will get credit with us if you do that. It's so good to see you. What a good group showing up with this busy holiday season, and uh, I do hope it's been a great Christmas. Thank God you're back if you've been away and you're safe. We pray for those that are away that they'll return to us safely with great and excitement and anticipation what God will do in our place in 2024. If um, the last half of 2023 is any indication, we are about to have a wonderful ride into the new year, and we'll give him all the glory. I'd like to encourage you to take your Bibles or whatever copy of God's Word you have with you today to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And on this last day of 2023, I'd like to turn to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and the next to last chapter, Revelation 21, to take a look at this New Year's Eve perspective. And on the eve of a new year, Let's see what will be for us a new beginning, not starting tomorrow only, but for followers of Jesus in this room, a new beginning for us in all of eternity, an eternity that is filled with hope and optimism and confidence as we are followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation 21, if I could give you a title, it would simply be this, a, a new everything. That's pretty comprehensive. Just a new everything. And that's what Revelation 21 begins to unpack for us. It says in verse 1 of Revelation 21, John is writing from the Isle of Patmos in isolation. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throng saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then look at this. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death. Amen. Amen. There'll be no more mourning or crying or pain. Amen and amen. For the old order of things has passed away. Hallelujah. The old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated, seated, seated on the throne, that's the Lord Jesus, says, I am making everything new. That's the title today, a new everything. I'll make everything new. And then he said this, write this down. For these words are, and I love this, these words are trustworthy and true. What is Revelation 21 about? Well, it graphically describes, if you will, the end of this world that we're living in right now. And yet it doesn't end there. It also describes the beginning of another world that will be created Human history began in a garden. We call it the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis. And human history as we know it in this context will end with an eternal city, a garden city. And it will be our final home. It will be our eternal home. So if you know Jesus, if you are confident that Christ is your Lord and Savior this Lord's day, I want to have some time with us on this last day of the year to project into eternity and for us to be reminded or perhaps for you and your Christian experience to learn for the very first time what your future eternity with Jesus Christ, our future eternity, will look like. We begin this new year and I was tempted, as I am always, and I say that in a positive way, to start outlining uh, resolutions and challenges to you about the beginning of 2024. But as I looked at our sermon calendar and how the Lord is directing us in our preaching on Sunday mornings here, 
I see that it's going to be a year of us challenging people to have confidence in Christ because 2024 is going to be a rocky year for the nation. Prepare for it. It's going to be unbelievable. But in the midst of all that, we need to be real centered, really centered in our faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. I want to this morning to share with you in these verses that the way it is right now, it won't always be like this. It won't always be as it is at the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024. And as you look at these words, I want to encourage you that the Lord Jesus himself says to John on the Isle of Patmos as he records what he sees, he says the words of Revelation 21 that we've read are trustworthy and true words. They were then and they are trustworthy and true words to take us into 2024. There are five verses that we speak of on this morning, and they are about a new creation or a recreation. These verses speak of making everything we know and experience in our earthly life today makes everything we know brand new. Now, if I could offer a timeline as to when these things happen, it would simply work this way. We live in this present age that we refer to the majority of in our church would be that this is the church age. This is the age of grace. This is the age in which the church takes the gospel to the world. And the great promise that we have is the, is the appearing of the Lord Jesus in the air, the rapture of the church, the gathering of his church. He meets us in the air. He takes us to heaven. And here on this earth, it moves into a period called the tribulation. Three and a half years of some degree of peace and prosperity and three and a half years, the latter part of pain and misery. And at the end of that tribulation period will come the Lord Jesus Christ in the air from heaven to this earth to defeat his enemies of the Antichrist, the false prophet. Uh, there will be a judgment on this earth, the battle of Armageddon. It will be an incredible, awful, terrible time. The church will be behind him. As he comes to this earth and he will come and he will establish again the majority opinion in our church. He will establish a, a millennial kingdom, 1,000 years of him ruling and reigning in the area of Jerusalem over this world, and it will be a thousand years of incredible reign and presence. Then following that millennium, there will be a bit of rebellion by the enemy, and the enemy will rise up. And he will be defeated, and the Lord Jesus will cast him, along with a false prophet, along with Antichrist, into a lake of fire, a pit, and forever bound there will those enemies of God be. And then you come to Revelation, which by the way, these things are described in Revelation 20. And in Revelation chapter 21, we move into an era that this context is it is the new heavens and the new earth. So let's begin as we see where this will take place out there more than a thousand calendar years from now. The very first thing that we see in this passage is that there is a new heaven. You see it there in verse one. Then I saw a new, N-E-W, a new heaven. Now, there are a lot of thoughts out there and in this room about heaven. Some of it has creeped into the church, which the world has created some idea of a, some utopian heaven. Some of it is a man-made, human-made sentiment. Some of it about heaven is very sticky. It is very sentimental. It gets very emotional. For instance, I've, I've done hundreds of funerals. And in some eulogies I've heard where a relative is talking about the person who's passed away who loved to fish and get up and say, you know, I bet grandpa's up there in heaven right now fishing with Jesus. Don't think so. Okay, it's a sentiment. Means well, but that, that's not a biblical view of heaven. The, the loved one that passed away loved golf. I bet uncle so-and-so is up there in heaven teeing off and playing golf with the disciples. And everybody smiles and laughs, but probably not. That's probably not happening in there. So my, my point being is that when it comes to heaven, sometimes we, we move into some type of uh, cinematic or uh, script 
of making us feel better about what, what, what heaven is. Those are fictional accounts. What we know that heaven is, its present state, and a new heaven that I'll talk about in a few moments, this new heaven is, is, is very, the, the old heaven, the present heaven is very real, and the new heaven will be very real. It is a place. It is a place that resides right now. When you and I die in this present situation we are in in this world, our bodies will be put into the ground. Some are cremated, but the body will begin to decay, but our spirit will go to be with the Lord in heaven. When you die as a follower of Jesus Christ, you go to be in heaven. And heaven is where God's presence is greatest. It is centered. And Jesus Christ sits there at the right hand of Jesus Christ. He is there enthroned in heaven. Christ follower, when you die, your name is in heaven. Your address when you die will be heaven. When you die, you go to heaven. You do not go to some other kind of place. You go to heaven. To be absent in the body, the scripture says, which is death, is to be present with the Lord in heaven. We spent a month with Isaiah in uh, the earlier chapters of 6, 7, 8, and 9, where there are these incredible prophecies made about, uh, from Isaiah about the Lord Jesus Christ that came, through, came true. They were, were with precision-like accuracy. It's interesting to me that the same prophet speaks with the same degree of confidence and certainty about the reality, not only of heaven, but Isaiah, 600 years before the birth of Christ, even talks about a new heaven. In Isaiah 65, verse 17, Isaiah says, see, the Lord says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. One chapter later in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22, he's almost at the end. And at the end, it's like a signature piece of his book of the Bible. He says in verse 22, Isaiah 66, 22, as the new heavens and the new earth that I will make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. Now, when you read about the Bible, you get into the scriptures, and we have some marvelous Bible teachers in our church. If you are not in a life group in our church that meets at 930s, beginning again in 2024, this next Sunday, I hope that you will be a part of that. It's an opportunity to roll up your sleeves, we have men's studies, Bible studies throughout the week, and we really have some wonderful Bible teachers here. And as Bible teachers in our church know that whenever you begin to explore the scripture, you see on this issue of heaven that the Bible kind of, kind of describes, if you keep unfolding the context for the word heaven, you'll find three different kinds of heavens described. Three, yes, three. The first heaven, as described in the scripture, are basically if you just can look through the windows, through the screens, you'll see the blue sky. If you look that way, you'll be blinded by the light and sue our church. Don't look that way. If you'll go this way, you will see the blue sky. That blue sky that sometimes has white clouds is sometimes gray when it is cloudy or rainy like it was over the holidays for several days. That is, if you will, the first heaven. When a rocket is launched at Cape Canaveral and it goes into the sky and it is seen itself going through those, the burly sky, as the poets call it, goes up there and then disappears beyond the blue from the earth's surface upward toward the blue sky and that rocket disappears. That's what you would call the first heaven. It's the sky. It's, it's where we fly when we get on airplanes. It's where the birds fly. It's that, it's that area that you go to right before you begin to see the stars and things begin to be dark and you begin to not have gravity. 
the billionaires that have built the rocket, some of them launching from Texas, they go up and you'll see the film, you'll see or the tape, the cameras, they will, they will be up there and they'll say, okay, you've got a couple minutes. They get out of their, their seats and then they float weightlessly where they are in a place between the, the blue and the black in that atmosphere where there's no, there's, there's, there's no gravity and they have a couple minutes and then it goes down. The rocket is not designed like the NASA rockets to be, go beyond into the orbit. That is what we would call the first heaven. The second heaven would be those stars beyond the blue. If you remember the movie, it's an old movie now, but a classic. If you haven't seen it, you should check out the right stuff. Chuck Yeager, the famous Air Force pilot, test pilot, was not chosen or was not eligible for whatever to become one of the first pilots of NASA, the Apollo crews, as which the movie's about. These pilots had the right stuff. Yeager had the right stuff for whatever reason, wasn't eligible or wasn't interested. But out of curiosity one day, he took off and the movie just beautifully shows it. He wanted to see what those astronauts were seeing. And so he took a test pilot a test jet into the sky and he went as far as he could go and it dramatically captures in the film the Chuck Yeager character and, the, and, and, and everything inside that cockpit was just shaking and vibrating and it was about, it seemed to fall apart. And for just a moment, Yeager, who had spent his life in the sky for the first and only time, saw, if you will, the dark and the stars and where the planets reside beyond the blue. That's the second heaven. That's the outer space. That's where the NASA projects have flown for most of our lives. They journey through the second heaven. Think about outer space. Think about Star Trek. Think about Star Wars going boldly where no man had ever gone before. That's the second heaven. And then there is in the Bible a third heaven. Paul actually witnessed it and says, I went to that third heaven. And when Paul got there, he saw in his vision of the third heaven and is affirmed as scriptures will show us in the minutes to come. This is where the throne of God resides. In fact, in, in verse three, if we go back to Revelation 21, uh, verse three speaks of this throne. It says there in verse in verse three, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. That is the third heaven. The third heaven is, if you will, that place for eternity for us where we will live when we die. The present third heaven one day will be consumed and there will be a brand new heaven. Uh, this is not, if you will, a, a, a renovation. This is not um, heaven flipping. Um, have you seen the mod houses in East Cobb? Can we talk? I, and if you are a builder, developer, if you may have moved here and just bought that house, one of them, and y'all aren't going to like me very much, but I just don't get the mod houses because I remember what the houses looked like before. Those are flips. They are renovations. When Paul talks about a new heaven and John here talks about a new heaven, he's not talking about flipping heaven. He's saying that there is going to be, and watch this carefully, there's going to be a brand new heaven after the one that is there presently in eternity. There will be no sun. There will be no moon. There will be no stars. There'll be no need for the sun uh, because God will be the light. There will be a, a whole new atmosphere. It'll be a whole new sky. It'll be a whole new universe. Just a few books of the Bible over in, in 1 Peter, 2 Peter, pardon me, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. Look at verses 10 through 13. I believe I have them for you. It says this. This is Peter writing, talking about the heavens, new heavens. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. <sighs> the elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It will be burned up. Heaven and earth, as we know it, will be burned up. And he writes then, since everything will be destroyed in this way, 
What kind of people ought you to be? And then he gives a practical application because you have an eternity with God. He says, as you live here, you ought to live life, holy, live lives that are holy and godly. And you should look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to what? A new heaven and a new earth where righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, the body of Christ will dwell. So this idea is beyond our words, it's beyond our tongues, it's beyond our ability to accurately describe, but there is a description told to us that in the future, there will be a new heaven. Then secondly, you go back to the passage. He says in Revelation 21 verse 1, not only did I see a new heaven, but I saw a new, a new earth. Literally, the new earth. Now, if you're interested in climate, global warming, or freezing, if you have natural, sincere concerns about that, I think we can help on this this morning from God's word. Secondly, there will be a new earth. Literally, the new earth will have a different character than this present earth. There is coming a day when this present earth will pass away. But it will not happen until after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ for 1,000 years. That 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ will happen with this present earth. So for at least 1,007 years... This earth will stay as it is in its present state. It is not going to be destroyed. Now remember what John said. These words are trustworthy and true. So I just want to say to you lovingly, with pressure you may feel upon you, be very careful about your projections and what you hear concerning planet earth. God is in control. And if this world is destroyed and the earth will be destroyed, it will happen by God, the creator and sustainer of all things. And he will do it in his way. It will not be a man-made way as we believe the Bible. Now, in our church, if you're new to us, we believe the Bible to be true from Genesis to Revelation. And this is in Revelation 21. There are 22 chapters in Revelation. If this was in Revelation 23, we would not believe it, okay? We believe this to be true because it is in the scriptures. The chief difference between this present earth that will be destroyed by God and the recreation or the creation of a new earth the major distinction between what it is and what it will be is found in verse one. It says that with this new earth, there will be no more seas or oceans. It's right there in verse one. There were no longer any sea. Now this present earth, as you geography teachers know, has about 70, 71% of water on its surface. Water covers most of the earth's surface. But in this new earth that God will create or recreate, there will be no more seas. There will be water, but there will be no more seas or oceans. Now, there's some geographical difference, obviously, with water and seas and no water or no seas. But I think this is also a reminder of sometimes what water would be seen as in the ancient world. Obviously, there are positive aspects of water then as there are now. But if you think about the Bible and the days of John and others who lived in that era, water in the Bible oftentimes meant danger. It meant storms. It meant tribulations. It meant isolation. I mean, John himself, as he wrote this, was the, on the island of Patmos, and he was never going to get off that island. He was put there as a recluse. It was part of a prison punishment. Water is also, for Bible students, a reminder of the flood. We believe here our position is that 
there was a great flood, that God sent a great flood, and that for 40 days and 40 nights changed the landscape of our world. And our world today is a reflection of, we believe, what happened years ago in the flood. The flood came because of sin being so great on this earth, and God does a do-over or start-over with Adam and his family. The flood came, and the waters of the flood was really seen as God's judgment. If you will, a world, a new world, a new planet, a new earth with no water is a reminder of a new earth where there will be no sin. And that seems almost incomprehensible to us because we live on what Paul called a groaning planet. And it groans in its creation because it is cursed with sin. In 2024, as we saw in 2023, <clears throat> the earth will groan with floods and earthquakes and fires and volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, the earth groans. And every day, if we look at life through a biblical worldview, we are reminded that this earth is cursed with sin. We live on a planet in misery. But verse 1 of Revelation 21 says this, this earth will experience some kind of redemption. Can I get some water, Scott? <coughs> Thank you so much. I'm going to drink the curse of water <laughs> and receive it as a blessing. This earth, according to Revelation 21.1, will experience redemption. Now, the Bible tells us the human soul must be born again. And this human earth that we are living in now will be born again. It will be made brand new. Now think about this in a very practical way. And this is sometimes, again, somewhat, we, we don't think like this because we get so geared in to news and current events. No longer will this earth be subdivided into cemeteries. No longer will this earth be subdivided into grave sites. No longer will blood fall on the ground as it's flowing on the ground of Gaza or Ukraine. No longer will this earth be infested with thorns and briars. No longer will the, will the soil absorb the teardrops of a broken-hearted widow. Yesterday afternoon, a Mr. Hughes, who was you know, part of Eastside a few years ago, passed away at age 91. And I went to the funeral home to see the family. He passed away over the holidays and was there with Mrs. Hughes and the family. And we prayed together and there she was, knowing her husband's in heaven, but her heart was broken and tears flowed. We're talking about a new earth. For those of us that are so invested in this earth, and I, and I speak of myself, but if we just get so consumed. This is not the final chapter. Great place for an amen right there. Just really, I mean, if you're a believer, I mean, we get so programmed into what oh, is going on in this world that is so broken. No longer will the soil absorb the teardrops of a broken hearted widow like Mrs. Hughes. There's going to be a brand new redeemed earth. Eden that was lost will be restored. Paradise that was lost will be regained. God will rebuild and renew this earth. Um, many of us in this room love the music, have for years, decades, maybe a lifetime, and love the music of, of James Taylor. And um, I don't like to pick apart a song, but let me do that, all right? I love James Taylor, but he had a song many years ago, and he had a lyric in it. And you can sing it, and it just sounds, you know, when you sing a James Taylor song, it's just, you just either sound really sad or, or really happy, one or the other. I don't know. But he had a lyric that said, you only have a short time on this earth. This here is it. No second birth. 
The writer of Revelation couldn't disagree more. He isn't saying that. He says there's more. There's more. There will be a new earth. A thousand years before, Isaiah wrote, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. Now, there is this fabulous verse that we know, but it becomes even more powerful to me at this moment. Matthew 24, verse 35, look at what Jesus says. Look at, look, look at this. Look at it. Jesus says, let me ask you a question. How important is the word of God? We're talking about daily reading the word of God, spending time with the word of God. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. Jesus says that, it will. But my words will never pass away. So in 2024, when we are so consumed with what's going on with our elections and our Supreme Court decisions and our candidates and our worldview and everything that we think is right and wrong, all of that stuff, don't get so carried away that you forget that you are people of the book. Heaven and earth will pass away. Elections come and go. Supreme courts come and go. Congresses come and go. Governorships come and go. But it is his word that will last forever. I say, why do you spend so much time here teaching the word of God? Because it's the only thing outside of Jesus himself that, that endures forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. That's what John is saying in Revelation 21. It's what Isaiah said. It's what Peter said. It's going, this present heaven and earth as we know it from the Bible, that will pass away. But by comparison, the word of God lives forever. And for those of us who believe the Bible, there's little argument about what this text says. There will be a new heaven and a new earth that will take shape after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Last point, and all of you are saying, thank God because it's 1202. Okay, I know, I know. Um, finally, there is a new city. It's verse two. He says here, there is a new city, a holy city, verse two. I saw it. It's a new Jerusalem. It's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. It's a new city. John calls it the holy city or the new Jerusalem. And it's a beautiful city. It is like a beautiful city, just like a bride. I, I've done a couple hundred weddings, maybe more. And I have never seen an ugly bride. Never, never, never. I mean, there is something stunning when that door opens and that bride is there. And I'm just the preacher standing there who will go by at the reception and maybe grab some punch and some potato salad. But what about the groom? I got a eye on him. Man, that guy, I've seen some guys almost pass out by the beauty of the bride. And this city will be beautiful. <gasps> beautiful like a bride about to come down the aisle to take the hand of the groom to be married. I love the present Jerusalem. I think, I think I've been seven times now. I love Jerusalem. I love the city. Love to walk the city. Love to go through the, the marketplaces. And I love the, obviously, the biblical sites. I love the city. I love the old city. The walls. I look at the eastern gate, the very gate where Jesus will return one day. I'd like to stand on the Mount of Olives, look across the valley over at the city, see the wall on the outer side. When I, when I as, as, as this John, me, I look at that city and I, I see it and I love it. But this John here in Revelation 21, he's talking now about a new Jerusalem. And you know, he called it New Jerusalem. John himself spent time in Jerusalem. He was with Jesus in Jerusalem. He was at the Mount of Olives. He was there when he couldn't stay awake, when Jesus asked him to stay up and pray with him before they came for, they came for his arrest. 
But John, he knew Jerusalem. He wasn't talking about that Jerusalem that I am talking about, that I love so much. He's talking here about a brand new Jerusalem. And he knew the Jerusalem we know. He saw a capital city created by the glorious workmanship of Jesus Christ. He saw the universal center of God's government in the eternal home of we, God's people. That's where we're going, folks, for eternity. New heaven, new earth, and a new Jerusalem dominated by the power and presence of God, a city of God. Three chapters early in Revelation 18, the same John writes about a city called the city of Babylon. It was a man, it was a a city that was made by men's sinful hands. Its whole purpose was to defy God. It was a city of sin. Three chapters later, he writes about a city called the New Jerusalem, not made with the hands of men with its purpose, but its purpose was to bring glory to God. And if you and I read on, and we will not do that, but if we were to read on into Revelation 21 and get into verse 9 and beyond, we would see vivid descriptions of this new Jerusalem, this new city, which will be 1,500 miles high. It'll be 1,500 miles wide. It'll be a size of a city that is the distance from Canada to Florida, New York City to Denver. It is described as floating above this new earth, this new Jerusalem will be, suspended in the new heavens, and the earth will revolve around this new Jerusalem because everything will revolve around Jesus Christ, who will be right in the center of it. You can take your Bibles and study verse after verse in John's Revelation, and it will tell you what, what is present in that city. You go further down into chapter 21. It, is, it has 12 layers of foundation stones, this new city, each inlaid with a different precious gem. The streets will be of pure gold. There will be a river, the tree of life, walls of jasper, gates of pearl. I long for that heaven, and I hope you do too. Because if the biggest thing on our agenda is who will win the national championship, who will win the Super Bowl, what's my stock going to do? What's my portfolio going to do? If the biggest thing on our agenda is is, is temporal and earthly, we're missing so much. Now, I got to finish. I, I, I've gone so long and I apologize. So my New Year's resolution will be starting tomorrow, I'll stop at 1158. All right. Maybe, maybe. All right. It's an impressive list of what is present in heaven, but I want to see this and I'll finish. The most striking thing to me about this new heaven, new earth and new city It's not what is present, but what is absent. Oh, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, I plead with you to look with me at verse four. Here's what will happen. Brokenhearted person today, person who is discouraged, Christian who is just down today and doesn't get it, doesn't understand it, and maybe even mad at God. There is coming this day, and look at this promise. It says that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. What is absent from heaven is there will be no, the new heaven is there'll be no more death, no more mourning, no crying, no pain for the old order of things has passed away. No more funerals, no more broken hearts, no more lies, no more betrayal, no more loss, no more misunderstandings, no more, no more, no more. Amen. That's our future. I'm glad I'm on my way to heaven. But I want to ask you as I finish, how about you? Do you know for sure that you are on your way to heaven? In the book of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul talks about anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. So you are in alignment, Christ follower. You and I who know Jesus, we are in alignment as a new creation 
to appropriately fit into a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem with our Savior. Allow me a moment to share the gospel with you. What makes someone a new creation in Christ Jesus, according to the gospel, is that you receive Christ as your Savior. You, you come to a point in your life where you understand that you are a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ in your life. You can't save yourself. You can't purchase it. You can't earn it. You can't borrow it. There's nothing you can do. Only you can place your trust in only what Christ has done. Die for your sins. So I'm going to lead in a prayer on this last day of 2023. And I beg and beseech any of you who are not sure today, if you were to die, that you would go to heaven. That you would pray with me silently where you are. This will be the last thing we do before we sing. And we go out to face 2024 together. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, would you pray with me this prayer if it applies to your situation? I just want to state it to you this way, not sensationally. I just want to state it to you this way. If you were to die this afternoon, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? If you do not know that, pray this prayer with me. Dear God in heaven, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I am a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I'm so sorry. You know everything I've done. Please forgive me. Make me new. Let the old go. And let the new come in. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that he died and that he rose and that he lives forevermore. Come live within me. Make me new. Give me a new name, a new identity, a new citizenship, a new sense of belonging. I believe Christ. If you prayed that prayer, Scott and I will be at the exits today and you can share that with us. We'd love to give you some materials to help you get started right. What a way to begin the new year. Knowing Christ. And for the rest of this church family, hey, Eastside, God's been so good to us. But the cares of this world, if we're not careful, can get in and choke, suffocate our relationship with Jesus. There's a lot of things that we want to be responsible and good stewards for here on this earth as witnesses for Christ. But when you say let's together not allow the things of the world and the pressures and the culture, all the things out there defeat us and alarm us to the point that we become stressed. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus in 2024. Let's stay in the word. Let's stay on our knees. Let's keep worshiping and witnessing together and watch what God does in our lives, in our families, in our enterprises, and what he will do in our local church. What a marvelous morning the Lord has given us.
together even when i don't see it come on even when even when i don't see it 